Manish, you you just now mentioned uh, roasting in one of the steps. So roasting would mean uh, that there will be loss of moisture, right? So yeah. that would mean loss of weight. So how much of weight is lost? I think the uh, roasting is um, yes, it's loss of moisture and loss of weight. But I think that would be about you know usually you lose about twenty percent of the twenty uh, percent weight. Yeah, so hundred whatever. Kilos yeah. of green bean would be about eighty or kilos of roasted Absolutely. beans. But I think the more important step, the reason why roasting is important, because it is not a, it is not just a means of conversion uh, to make it a consumable product. But I think the roasting process really is uh, one of the key drivers for development of the coffee aroma. Sure, because, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I I get that. No, no. One of the reasons why I asked this question is, I think uh, later when we discuss prices, I want people to understand that uh, you know that uh, when Manish buys hundred kg of co- green coffee and then you know he or his customer uh, roasts it, they are left with uh, only eighty kg, right? Yeah, yeah. So which means they have lost a uh, uh, certain amount of the. you know the the money that they paid to to the fire god so which yeah. <laughs> means it's you know the the people's default assumption that intermediary makes more money like 20% jyada paisa le le you know as it has charged right. 20% more or whatever that there are steps in the process that you described where various things happen and it is not a straight connection between purchase price and your markup so so you know we'll yeah. i want to i just wanted to leave that thought in people's mind that uh, you know when you buy 100 kg after roasting the buyer has only 80 kg of coffee left to sell right so right. Yeah. so so that's where it fitted in but before we go into the prices which we which should come up uh, pretty soon you know um Uh, in india people blend coffee with uh, uh, thing called chicory so is that done in other country and what exactly is chicory's role in indian coffee so yes it is uh, i mean it is done in some of the other countries i think in south america which is where the chicory originates i think and also in one or two countries in europe but predominantly i think on scale the usage of chicory is more in india and i think the drivers of that are Um, are a few. So one, of course, is cost uh, because it is much cheaper than coffee, and therefore it kind of helps bring down the price of the coffee. The second, I think, is uh, is the the body because chicory on its own, if you have tried chicory, it's very bitter mm. and uh, very thick, viscous kind of a liquid. Mm. So uh, so when you blend that with coffee, it provides a certain um, strength and a bit of. Uh, of the body to the coffee so it and from you know people uh, you know who are drinking let's say um, espresso or maybe even the indian filter coffee method the crema that you see on the top when you when you the foam or the froth that gets generated when you when you do a a coffee cup right it gets enhanced because that that there is more of that uh, uh, in uh, chicory than chicory. in in proper coffee if you do full coffee you will never have that foam or the froth being there for a long time uh-huh. it it okay. dissipates very fast but That's people like it you know when you do That's that and it, it stays there for a while so yeah, yeah, yeah. so that crema is is um, is is also why chicory is used That's so. interesting so so uh, earlier you mentioned that robusta adds <clears throat> body and bitterness to coffee now chicory takes it to the next level yeah <laughs> yeah yes yes <laughs> right okay so so let's uh, move on to the other point that uh, you know um, i was just alluding to before this this, this point we, we we talked about is um, you know what are the major factors that influence price in 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 this industry it's a, it's a mix of multiple factors like in any commodity and uh, i think with the advent of technology and information ubiquity mm-hmm. it's becoming you know market which has just so many moving parts uh, so you know some of the key factors one of course is uh, the supply two-year and cycle? demand yeah two year cycle si- the two year cycle and of an overall supply and demand within that cycle because like i said you know when we talk of uh, crop balance sheets mm. normally uh, obviously you would talk on a on a larger broader scale one coffee balance sheet but like i told you you know the way trade looks at it you will say the natural balance sheet the washed balance sheet and the robust balance sheet yeah and therefore each of these three balance sheets will have some interaction because there is a bit of uh, uh, 
substitutability between these. So mm. if, if there is a problem in Wash Arabica, if Colombia is having a problem, uh, you know, some of the uh, users, if they are forced to, will obviously first choice would be to move to other washed suppliers, so a Honduras, right. a Guatemala, or whatever. Right. But if they can't do it and there's not enough, then they try and use a little bit more of Brazil in that blend to kind of compensate and make sure they still are not able to or not tweaking the, the blend too much. So, mm. so that's so it's basically the balance sheet or uh, supply and demand, which is the primary thing. But then, of course, like I mentioned, I today the you know, issues around um, the non-commercial participation, so funds participation in the markets, which can be a big mover. Mm. Uh, the overall, you know, um, investment climate, the, the various macroeconomic issues around currency, because that determines the large uh, extent what prices local producers get for their product mm. and interest rates, freight rates. So it's a, it's a mix of a lot of things, but with, I would say, the supply demand and, uh, and, the non-commercial participation and the uh, interplay between the sub-coffee balance sheets, I think, which is probably a large driver uh, of, of coffee prices. Okay. So, so apart from the cyclical nature, uh, give the you know being a agricultural crop, it also gets affected by uh, insects, viruses, etc. Right. So, which yeah. are the ones which which um, affect it, and is there a pattern to those things? So, so yeah. So, uh, like any crop, I think uh, weather is is one part of it, but pest and disease is the other part. Somewhere they are correlated as well, because you know if temperatures are high, you tend to get more of more some insects. insects. Right. So, but in coffee, uh, arabica, like I said, is more susceptible. So, it probably you hear more of that. So, some of the uh, uh, pest and diseases that you kind of uh, see or hear more which have more impact on coffee would be um, Arabica coffee has the issue of refrust, right? So, right. in fact, it was in the news, let's say, eight, ten years ago in a big way, slightly right. more. I think in 2008, 2009, mm. Colombia had, uh, and Colombia and uh, most of the countries in Central South Central America had the issue around coffee leaf rust, which is basically a fungal disease and, you know, right. It impacts uh, leaf drop and therefore the ability of the plant to generate or produce fruit. Mm. And uh, it's a it's a disease that is doesn't kill the plant really, but it takes a lot of time and effort to revive it back to good productivity. So you lose big time productivity. And okay. Colombia, Colombia, from being the you know uh, third largest coffee producer, actually had a drop of over fifty percent uh, wow. of their crop. And the and, and the government then embarked on a big program of replanting uh, with better varieties that were leaf rust uh, tolerant or resistant. Right. <clears throat> so, so, so leaf rust would be one of the key ones, but then others would be the stem borer, the coffee berry borer, which what which kind of, you know, is when you see a coffee bean, some of them will have small holes. Mm -hmm. And that's because this berry borer has eaten through it when the coffee was a fruit. Mm -hmm. And then you have the leaf miners. So there are quite a few, but I would say leaf rust, the, the borers, leaf miners, these would be some of the important uh, uh, Issues. Right. So uh, as we move the discussion mm -hmm. forward in the next segment, uh, you know, let's discuss how the industry has changed um, since you, you know, started out um, way back. So Manish, what have been the uh, major events in the history of coffee business over the last few decades, uh, you know, which you wanted, would, you would yeah. prefer to highlight maybe top four, top five, so in my opinion, uh, I would rather look at this as either events because, you know, in coffee events uh, are usually related to a frost in Brazil yeah, or, 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 or you know, more weather related events. Right. Um, and then I would probably also want to look at some inflection points where which have kind of shaped the trade and the consumption of coffee to where we are today. So from, um, I had both in mind. So yeah, we are on the so, same page. Yeah. So, um, so I would say, you know, uh, the first uh, for me would be the uh, breakdown of the uh, ICO price stabilization mechanism, or it was like a quota uh, system that existed pre 80, I think late 80s, 80, it, it, it broke down in 89. But pr prior to that, for almost quite, quite, I think maybe two decades or more than that, we were basically working at um, as a quota uh, led trade where 
each country, the ICU, which is the International Coffee Organization, uh, had for each country, producing country, a quota going to which consuming country, and therefore it kind of made sure prices were stable. And every country had an opportunity to sell what it produced mm -hmm. without getting to too much productive capacity or or kind of cutting back production because it was not. So it was, and I think that uh, that um, uh, agreement ended uh, in late 80s, in 89, I think. And I think that is when really for the first time, so 30 years ago, where coffee was left to its own economics, where uh, it was left to producers to decide how much they would want to grow and find their own markets and also to basically determine the pecking order globally that whoever was the most efficient kind of one and, and and i think that is how if we see it is in these last 20 30 years while brazil was always the base but i think the <clears throat> the growth over these years has been dominated by the most efficient producers, whether it was Brazil, it was Vietnam, maybe to some extent Honduras, some of, you know, maybe a bit of Uganda. So these are the ones, the producers that have moved. So for me, that was one inflection point. Uh, the second, I think, obviously I talked about frost. So, you know, that has always been a big issue for coffee because if the largest producer and the largest by far has this issue around the frost because of the uh, where they grow coffee and those areas are susceptible to frost then you know obviously we've not seen a frost for a long time but you, the last severe frost was in 99 and a very severe one in 94 2000 we had a mild frost but after that really for the last 20 years uh, we've not had any uh, significant frost event yes minor events yes but so climate change there has kind of been there but frost was one one uh, thing that kind of has always been after us uh, uh, so the the other uh, third one I would say is uh, the what we in coffee we call you know coffee people love to call especially in the new age coffee they love to call the whole coffee consumption story in three waves now of course there are fourth and fifth but I would stick to the original three wave th theory so well. first wave was more around people you know when coffee became available to the masses in a easy consuming format so it was the maxwell house the you know those kind of people where they made coffee or folgers mm -hmm. available in the us and that is the first wave obviously these the waves refer primarily to the coffee movement in the in the us because that has been the the real innovator in coffee uh, for us, ever since and mm. the second wave so that is what i was saying, coming to the second wave is where i think it was another uh, good turning point for us which was basically the move of out of home led by the likes of starbucks and mm. then you know by uh, people like peach as well where you had these mushrooming stores people really getting into the habit of going across in the morning before office picking up a coffee from a coffee shop good coffee but uh, really the format changing into that so that really was was the second wave uh, for us Sure. Then, of course, moving into the third wave, which um, also has really is what we, we we are probably in an extended version, which is what people call the fourth or the fifth. But it's really the third wave is the movement towards specialty coffee, right? Where where origin, province, and provenance and sustainability became in the focus. Direct trade, where you could you know buy coffee, uh, knowing fully well where the coffee came from, who the farmer was, what the variety was you know what kind of conditions it was grown in and what all went in the coffee right. and i think the other last part would be uh, what i would say as single serve which is basically again a movement that started quite early but it gained trend in the last 15 uh, odd years where you know uh, nespresso uh, green mountain keurig which is now uh, keurig dr peppers these were the leaders who kind of moved in and it kind of changed the uh, consumption format for coffee for high quality coffee at home so basically right. trying to give you a second wave and a third wave experience at in the comfort of your house so these are some of the trends i think that uh, have been important for us that's that's very well put and i think we will revisit them later in the discussion but uh, you know um, you know I, I wanted to sort of uh, um, look uh, explore a little more about uh, Vietnam, which you, which uh, you know, where you have been, you have spent early part of your career. You talked about that, like, like you know, uh, people in the past uh, didn't, you know, wouldn't think of like Vietnam as a major uh, player in the coffee business. So, so you know, it was not a major producer at all, and started 
growing coffee commercially probably in the mid 90s is that correct right so what exactly happened uh, yeah, i think you said it's probably around 20% of the market so so you know uh, what what led to this transformation that it has become a major producer major exporter and that too it's a tree drinking country yeah <laughs> traditionally so i think i think it's a it's a classic uh, case study uh, of an origin and a country that wanted to um, improve the uh, livelihoods of uh, people and producers and in the central highlands i think it was a mix of uh, government uh, support initially because you know the government went about it trying to put across a framework mm. to be a large coffee producer so it was very clear that they had a vision so they put out all the small constituents of building up a coffee business so they started with having a few large state owned farms mm. which would be the the you know the fulcrum where you could probably do outdoor programs training for farmers to do because they never seen a coffee plant right and it came from outside so they brought in good varieties they created a few research stations uh, where they would research on good varieties on better practices of farming on on good husbandry uh, they also created a infrastructure in terms of engineering infrastructure to create a few state owned companies or entities that were involved in manufacturing coffee machines mm -hmm. and their whole idea was to you know get machines from some of the other developed producers like brazil mm -hmm. and reverse engineer them of saying look you know what, how do we make a grader how we, how do we make a you know this toner and you know you just reverse engineer that and i think right. with that and with a lot of the work around it that was really the first impetus but i think a large part of that success story should has to go to the producers of vietnam because of their sheer uh, you know entrepreneurial spirit wanting to go out there and really improve life for themselves without relying entirely on the government to help yes government help is there and i think once that initial uh, you know i would say when i moved to vietnam in um, in um, early part of 2000 20 years ago Vietnam was a four five hundred thousand uh, ton producer. Yeah, today we are probably closer to just under two million tons. Yeah, and and you could see that you know farmers there were interested. They wanted to know. They wanted to learn. They wanted to experiment. They would see my neighbor has coffee. He's done well, and therefore I can do it as well. And you know, you kind of it is that sheer spirit of enterprise, which I think is has been the main reason for them to be up here and with good support infrastructure and uh, and a framework from the government to manage it and therefore like i said right up even up to exporters even today uh, there are many companies in the vietnamese um, coffee exporting ecosystem uh, that are state owned so right from owning farms to you know ancillary support services to r d to machinery manufacturing to exporter who is the final buyer the whole chain was supported by the state to make sure they have enough participation to make an impact. And once it became big enough, now there is no need for that. There's enough private enterprise that has come in there. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but yeah, it was a good mix. They allowed of that also. They allowed yes. private enterprise. Okay. okay. So, so we looked at the, you know, uh, um, supply chain, uh, you know, if, uh, in, or value chain for uh, in in uh, in the coffee. Uh, so what have been the uh, sort of like, uh, you know, major... Um, shifts or developments in the production side, um, processing side, industry consolidation, etc. I know some of it we have, we have mentioned, but maybe in this question you could take. Yeah, a deep dive. I'll just yeah, I'll just uh, revisit that. So, uh, among the shifts, uh, one would be, of course, which I mentioned earlier, was uh, the consolidation of producers. So mm -hmm. basically. Uh, Brazil and Vietnam, and to some extent Honduras and Uganda, but primarily a large chunk of the growth that we've had in terms of production has been coming from Brazil and Vietnam. So today, okay. uh, you know, yep. that's, that's yep. one. Uh, in terms of industry consolidation also, yes, that in the last few years, there has been a fair bit of consolidation where uh, there's been, a, you know, people uh, using the opportunity to uh, acquire different companies. So we see the JAB umbrella, which is, you know, JD, Curie, Dr. Peppers, Peets, mm. a lot of companies coming under a common umbrella. So th that's become a fairly large uh, group today. Uh, Nest Nestle, of course, has also been active, uh, uh, looking at expanding their business and also 
getting on some of the speciality uh, players like Blue Bottle is now part of Nestle. So there have been a lot of activity, m and activity going over the last few years. And that has uh, made these large pockets of uh, buyers, uh, which have a huge uh, uh, spread and access to customers and different formats. Um, the other would be the rise of certified and sustainable coffee. So that I think has been growing over the last few years. And uh, it today is there on the menu of every doaster, whether it is, you know, um, uh, certification in coffee, which are popular or are uh, the Rainforest Alliance, which is the green frog that we, you know, some of us would recognize in the shelf. Mm. Uh, the UTZ, which is um, Oots, which is more a Dutch led uh, certification, but very popular. Mm. Um, fair trade, of course, is more um, active in, in pockets um, in certain countries the 4C um, and also other uh, buyer specific because also what has happened is you know when you go out there um, some companies felt that it is difficult for the consumer uh, at the retail level to understand what is a rainforest or what is a oots and therefore they wanted it it, it is a better um, option to move into their own certification so they can do a lot of communication with their eventual customer on what all they do okay. to get the coffee from farm to cup but it is under their own certification program. So Starbucks has their own program, which is called CAFE, C-A-F-E, which is Coffee and Farmers Equity. Mm. And, and they have their own list of uh, guidelines of how to get certified for CAFE. And they, it's a mandate that anybody who supplies coffee uh, to them would have to be CAFE certified. Similarly, Nespresso has their own Nespresso AAA program, which is again a different program. So I think the rise of certified and sustainable coffees has been uh, exceptional in the last uh, two decades. Uh, the other part would be the impact. I think right now with the last year or so living with COVID, I think uh, we have seen a bit of a setback for the speciality and the small nano roaster market, you know, the homegrown roaster market, mm -hmm. because uh, the, these, these guys were really the exciting part of the speciality business in the US, uh, getting out new coffees, you know, unique stuff, but on small volume, small scale. And I think this whole lockdown and, and the lack of access to customer and, and market, I think has hit them hard. So it will take some time. I was reading some uh, news today also on one of the newsletters that um, in the US, which is really the hotbed of speciality uh, coffee. Coffee, yeah. Uh, they expect that you know, it will be back to normal only by 2023 um, okay. and maybe 65% back to normal by the end of 2021. So mm -hmm. uh, so that's one part, but that was really leading some of that growth. We, we hope it will come back uh, soon. The the last part, I think, is um, I would see that coffee has you know been so far, we have seen now for the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years, fairly recession-proof. And uh, mm. we have seen it uh, have a almost, uh, you know, standard growth uh, between one and a half and two and a half percent per annum over these years. Mm. And I think that has been in part been led by the level of innovation or the speed of innovations in the consumption format and the product format that continues to happen in coffee. And I right. think uh, that is uh, continues to pick up. So. Uh, that's that's how I would I, I would put the overall uh, way the current um, industry is positioned. Right, right. Um, anything unique about the uh, you know in, from the supply chain perspective? Anything that happened? Um, I, I know the things that you talked about do have a supply chain uh, you know uh, relevance, but uh, just in case, because in, in in some cases you know bulk handling technology blockchain whatever some things have uh, you know technological advancements have started making a difference uh, but you looked at it from from the other side so just wanted to know before we move on to discuss the consumer side of it so i think uh, in terms of the supply chain and the technology in supply chain i think the blockchain is something that you know obviously people have talked about and are talking about but uh, so far, it has not really seen big application in the origin side of things uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yet. Uh, where we do see um, some improvement or some, you know, the the advent of digital uh, mm -hmm. into mainstream supply chain procurement is 
um, is more around trying to see how we can enable technology to manage, create, and administer farmer groups uh, or, or small groups of farmers where you have either quality as a differentiator or a certification mm -hmm. as a differentiator. Mm -hmm. and, and also to enable that process uh, by allowing direct transactional access with that farmer or maybe a group of farmers with the eventual exporter. And right. um, I know that, you know, some of the companies, uh, including us, um, are doing a lot of work around creating that digital platform of being able to uh, both try in some cases and disintermediate and therefore reach the producer directly, but also to, in other cases, try and use technology to help the intermediary be a lot more efficient and therefore be able to provide and access a larger group or set of suppliers than currently is able to do that. So right. I, I would say uh, in that sense, you know, uh, coffee is uh, a traditional business and therefore in processing, while, you know, there's small changes that uh, keep happening, they're more incremental. I don't see any uh, at the buying side, barring this move towards digital enabled uh, procurement, I think in the processing side, it's still, uh, it's still pretty easy. much safe. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so that brings us to the to the interesting side, which you know you have uh, mentioned a couple of times on the consumer mm -hmm. side, right? Uh, you yeah. know, um, technological advancements uh, and you know uh, uh, dispensing how how people can consume it and how they can consume higher grade, higher flavor, uh, you know, yeah. um, uh, coffee in pods and so on. It's just. Uh, Quick question, you know, before you sort of probably want to add to what you have said, yeah. uh, you know, we also noticed that uh, China and India, which have been, you know, more tea drinking countries. I mean, India does have a, some tradition of coffee drinking, but China has taken on to coffee drinking and so on and so forth. So, so do you see some uh, market uh, uh, impact with these things? Uh, because some yeah. of the technological thing that we are talking about often refers to developed countries. So I just wanted to make sure that like we cover these countries, emerging economies coming up. And yeah, no, I think uh, the both China and India, of course, you know, uh, uh, started off as uh, are predominantly tea drinking countries. But I mm. think the culture of uh, drinking coffee is improving. Mm -hmm. uh, the normal trend when consumers move from tea to mm. coffee mm. is that they move first to soluble coffee. Because right. it is very, you know, it's the same level of convenience or whatever. And then to uh, graduating as they appreciate coffee better and quality better, then they start graduating to the RNG sector. Mm. And I think it's not different uh, to what's happening here. Mm. Uh, but China is also uh, seeing good growth. So in the uh, RNG and speciality now, of course, on a small base. So it's not really at a level yet that is moving the market, but it is increasingly becoming more and more important for everybody and earlier we saw in the you know in the phase of that move from tea to uh, soluble instant coffee uh, um, companies uh, large uh, global soluble companies moving their nestle craft moving their factories there and that has worked well mm. but now you also see a lot of the out of home demand you know the starbucks they are you know uh, their local homegrown uh, Coffee chains, companies yeah. like Luckin and all these. Yeah. So it's basically uh, a very moving market. Uh, India is also uh, uh, growing, I would say, at a smaller pace and at a smaller base than China. Uh, but it is also on that on that trend. And mm -hmm. uh, once we are done, or once you know, in the new post-COVID normal and the food service and the out of home thing picks up again, um, I see India also continue to move in that growth phase. Uh, so answering your other question on the consumer and changes, I think I mentioned that already, uh, but uh, just to refresh that. Uh, so some of the, you know, in the, on the supply, on the consumer end, it's basically been more around uh, good quality and uh, a different experience or a novelty uh, value as well as convenience continue to be redefined. So on the convenience side, premixes, uh, you know, good quality single serves, the experience of having the, a good cup of coffee at home is what is driving that single serve market. And therefore, single serve is good quality coffee, but available in an easier format. Uh, then uh, cold brew is another uh, area that has kind of been working quite uh, well in select markets and uh, 
uh, that is something to watch out for that going forward cold brew which is basically uh, you know uh, rtd kind of a format for coffee is uh, working well in the us and also we are seeing some good signs in other markets sure uh, the other area would be you know coffee fruit or cascara is as it called base drink so that's again something that is very niche very small and that's slowly picking up but looks uh, promising yes right 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 so so this is this is uh, so there a lot of activity a lot of action taking place on the consumer end and we should uh, look at the market right so yeah. keep uh, keep an eye on the market uh, Absolutely. Yeah. so 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 your your life is never boring right so so uh, viewers listeners join us back for the next part of the discussion with manish where we talk about uncertainty and risk management in the coffee business how does he manage it right so we'll uh, we'll join you in a, in in the next part of this discussion